Imagine a place where narwhals fly, where dryads and pixies and mermaids and fawns are neighbors. Skin changers, wild gin, dragons, and sasquatches can all live side by side in harmony. That is the place where I am from, a place in your mind that you've never really forgotten because you see it all the time in dreams. That is where wonder happens, a place called Wildwood, that space in the sky between two rainbows, right next to someday and right before happily ever after. My name is Persia Beatty, y'all. That's B-E-A-T-T-Y, honey. And I'm the steward of Wildwood and the Land of Door, and also the National Storyteller. I invite you to join me in the World Tree Library sometime. I'll be waiting there, next to the fire, with a seat just for you, and a story that'll make it worth your while. Welcome to Wonder Tales. Once in a lush valley, nestled somewhere between here and there, just a bit after between and right before near. Take your first left at the nanny goat and a right at the kissing stone, another right at the old burr oak stump that used to be a tree that had been struck by lightning and needed to be cut down. Past the dilapidated barn where nothing lived but a few lazy spiders, and just beyond the mid-sized lake away, there lived a king who had five daughters. Each of the daughters favored him in one specific way. The eldest was named Lena and had his cheekbones. The second eldest was named Rhonda and got the white streak down her hair that he had when he'd been born. The middle daughter was named Iona, and she inherited the way he held his hand to his heart every time he found something especially hilarious. The next to youngest daughter was named Cynthia, and she had his eyes and the right dimple in her cheek. And the youngest was named Giselle, and she had inherited his shrewd way with numbers and his passion for hounds, just like her old man. It was she who the old king spent most of his time with, for he had no sons, and he knew he would need someone eventually to at the very least balance the books of his kingdom for an heir, 
and also someone to go hunting with on occasion when the weather was right. As he wakes stone and years, the king, like any king, was not immune to the effects of time, and in his advanced age sometimes he mixed up his daughter's names. He would become confused in the moment and call for Iona when he meant Rhonda to bring him his pap. He'd ask Lena to smile for him at a story he was telling when it was Cynthia he meant, or he'd ask Rhonda to please paste the potatoes at supper time while he was looking at Giselle. So, in an attempt to keep everybody straight, the old king took to calling his daughters by number until one after the other they married knights or courtiers and moved away, except for Giselle, the youngest, who went to live with a spinster aunt so she could finish her charm lessons. He only ever saw them all together again on Easter's and Christmases until all who was left was Cynthia who he still only called number four. She called him King Dad. One evening at supper, King Dad was seated at one end of the long table, and Cynthia was seated at the other when he abruptly looked up as though remembering a train of thought he lost many summers ago, and perhaps he had. It was twilight, and Cynthia used to silent suppers with King Dad had just been gazing out of the faceted window at the particular azure of gloaming in late August, wondering whether or not it would be cloudy this year during the Perseid showers, and thought she was imagining things when King Dad called down the table, waving a servant who was coming to take away his plate. King Dad was still picking at the gristle on a chicken leg. Uh, gone somewhere now. Uh, number four. Cynthia looked up, expecting him to ask her to bring him the salt shaker. Yes, King Dad? How old are you, anyway? I'm 15, she called back. The flickering lights of the candelabras were the only sound for a moment. No, that can't be right. You was just 10 last year. I'm 15, Cynthia repeated. King Dad's eyebrows leapt to what was left of his hairline. Ladies, he roared, and two plump ladies-in-waiting popped out of what appeared to be one of the curtains, as though they were waiting for him to summon them at any moment, and in their little navy blue dresses and matching head wraps, disguised in tightly coiffed braids, curtsied before him at the same time. Yes, your majesty? How old is number four? he demanded suspiciously. She's fifteen, they said at the same time, their noses and eyes still pointed towards the stone floor. When was her first sackle? Three years ago, sir, the lady in waiting on the left told him. He could never remember their names or tell them apart entirely. <laughs> and you didn't tell me? King Dad waved away another servant who tried to take his salad plate where he picked out all of the croutons. King Dad hated croutons, but he liked having them on his salad so he could pick them off. Well, we tried to, sir, but that was around the time her mother, the lady in waiting on the rat said. Oh, right. A woman, King Dad scoffed. Well, can't be helped, I suppose she's late. I need y'all to get her measurements tomorrow and start getting her fitted for her gown. I know a duke nearby got a son about her age. And that was the end of it. The ladies in waiting scurried off, and King Dad shook his head. Number four, come down here, please. Cynthia was astonished. She couldn't remember the last time King Dad had summoned her so closely to him during a meal. She barely even saw him anymore except at supper time, so not unlike the ladies in waiting who just left, she too hustled down the length of the long table, which took almost a full minute to stay next to him. Yes, King Dad. Sit down, he said, and scooted himself back and patted his knee. All right, Cynthia said and awkwardly positioned herself on her father's knee which she hadn't done since she was ten, and steadied herself so she didn't put her full weight on his thin leg. He patted her back kindly. You love your papa, don't you? Of course, King Dad, Cynthia said. King Dad closed his eyes and nodded. Of course you do. Of course you do. It's time you were married, my dear. But... My best friend Janie didn't have to get married until she was 16, and my other best friend Lucy didn't have to either. How come I have to? Because you're a king's daughter that makes you a princess. Your sisters were married at 15, and you shall be married too. Now, Duke Festus has a son about your age. Jeffrey? He's 27! 
perfect. He'll have far more energy to train a wife than a man twice his years. He put hay in my hair when he came to visit. Childish folly, my child. Y'all were just children. It was last year. He likes you, King Date smiled. He's already initiated courtship. That's excellent. It's his way of saying hello and I think you're fetching. He has the complexion and smell of the inside of a potato. A man who works the land is bound to have a few flaws, my dear. Try and focus on the attributes such as we'll be able to keep his family's land as an extension of our own. They have a wonderful vineyard and acres and acres of wheat and corn we'll be able to make a profit off of with this union once you all start having children. Children? Cynthia stared at King Dad, who was already fantasizing about the gold piling up in his vault. He bounced Cynthia on his knee as though shushing a small child. Children are a part of life, my dear. Now, the ladies will be fitting you tomorrow. I go over to see Festus in the morning. Your dowry will be tabulated and it's all settled. You'll be married within a month. Off to bed with you. Big day tomorrow. And he stopped bouncing his knee and looked at her expectantly. Can I, can I at least have to serve? What they having in that? Vicky Pudding. Oh, yes. Uh, I suppose. Have Gray bring it up to your room. Gray, he said to the butler in the corner. Number four will be having her dessert in her room tonight. Excellent choice, Your Majesty, Gray said in a voice that was as nonplussed and unflappable as his name. And Cynthia went to bed that night, barely able to taste the figgy pudding as she listened to the sounds of rustling gowns in the next room as the ladies in waiting unboxed veils and pearls and slippers and under things. By midnight they left, and now knowing what every woman learns the hard way at some point, that is, what it means to wake up one morning a girl and go to bed the same night a woman, Cynthia sat straight up in her bed. She would not marry pasty, smelly Jeffrey. She would run away. There was a small paddle boat down by the lake, and if she left now with everyone asleep, she'd be clear over to the next kingdom by morning. And so that's how the first wave of the Perseids found Cynthia streaking swift and soft as first kisses between lovers across the midnight sky. And she was rowing to save her own life in her bedclothes slippers and a jacket a knapsack on her back with a few cakes and a flask of water, a pouch of coins, and no idea where she was going next, except for mourning. Eunice and Sylvie were the names of the ladies-in-waiting that King Dad had put in charge of preparing his daughter, Cynthia, who he sometimes called his favorite number four, to become a bride. Eunice had been the one on the right during the first portion of our story, and Sylvie was on the left. Their orders from King Dad jeopardized nothing for these two family servants, who had watched all five of his daughters from infancy grow into bright and capable young women in their opinion, with the exception of Iona, who was prone to mood swings and torrential storms of tears. Number three had been married off at 14, not three years ago, because King Dad couldn't take the temper tantrums anymore over salad dressing or a bee floating in through a window. Mayhem, bedlam, chaos, anarchy. That was Iona for you. 
she had turned out to be his most expensive daughter with a strong throwing arm and had cost King Dad a small fortune in window, flatware, and mirror replacements alone. So Eunice and Sylvie had very much been looking forward to the cakewalk it would be to prepare Cynthia instead, who was by comparison much more civilized and only prone to daydreaming which would write itself once she started having youngings. In a fortnight, Cynthia was supposed to wed a duke's son, Jeffrey, twelve years her senior, but first in line to inherit his father's entire estate. It was a very good match, everyone thought, until the morning after King Dad announced to his favorite number four that she'd be getting married in a month's time, as was custom for a princess her age. The next morning, no one could find Cynthia. Her bedchamber door was locked and bolted. It had taken three servants all morning to break through the heavy door into Cynthia's bedroom, and when they burst in at last, toppling over one another in the process, King Dad stepped right over them and their makeshift battering ram into his daughter's empty bedchamber. Suddenly feeling spry in his old age, something of the king he had been in his youth when he was first crowned came to laugh in his eyes, and he whirled around the room, flinging pillars and curtains aside and ripping open wardrobe doors. Where is she? King Dad roared to nobody, and his butler Greg calmly stepped over the mess to escort the forlorn king into one of the chairs Cynthia normally sat in to read by the window. King Dad was so angry at Cynthia's betrayal, hot tears streamed down his cheeks into his beard, and the birdcage of his chest heaved like bellows over a fireplace. If King Dad had been a dragon, he would have set the whole castle aflame with his dismay. As it was, he wasn't a dragon, and Gray knew just what to do. He calmly stuffed King Dad's favorite long pipe with hookweed, which in that region worked like a sedative, and held the pipe to his master's lips, coaching him to inhale until King Dad calmed down and started to breathe normally. Cynthia was gone, that's what. No note, no map, no indication whatsoever that she was ever coming back. She's just like her mother. King Dad lamented to Grey, who patted the king's back, nodding sympathetically, while violet plumes of hookweed surrounded his head as the king helplessly wept into his pipe. Eventually, a search party was sent out that afternoon, and there was a missing paddle boat and a few loaves of bread stolen from the pantry, so everyone knew what had happened. Or so they thought. Of all the ungrateful, Eunice was saying as they went about their chores, folding bed sheets, two weeks after Cynthia left. Selfish? Don't forget selfish, Sylvia agreed, tucking the corners of the fitted sheet expertly. They were like two geese grappling over breadcrumbs. Entitled, Eunice fumed on her king's behalf. Spoiled? Don't forget spoiled, Sylvia nodded. These princesses don't know how good they have it, Eunice felt. Even every opportunity women like you and me would never even conceive of. And all they have to do is lay around and get pregnant once in a while. Oh, look at me, Sylvie mocked. I'm so tired of eating all these delicious desserts every night out of season that my servants have to go out of all their way to get for me whenever it suits my fancy. So tired, Eunice echoed, of noblemen's sons wanting to marry me and make me even more filthy rich. <laughs> they had had a front row seat for two weeks to King Dad's meltdowns as no news of Cynthia from any of the nearby kingdoms could be found. He'd sent couriers and knights, and even Jeffrey himself made an attempt to find his betrothed on his horse. He trotted a few laps around the lake the first day, and it was he who found the abandoned paddle boat near the neighboring kingdom, but no trace of Cynthia. Just the jacket she had worn, the night she fled, and the knapsack. Which started the rumors that maybe number four had been kidnapped. Maybe she was being held for ransom. 
King David spoke to his counselors very seriously for two weeks about the possibility that they'd have to go to war over his favorite number four. He scheduled a review of the barracks and his standing army just in case and could be seen heading off to the war room with his general who carried scrolls and maps behind his leash. The civilians were quite nervous about this prospect. They'd all enjoyed peacetime for so long. Nobody had lost able-bodied sons to battle in years and now this imminent looming suggestion hanging in the air of a war? With war came inflation and often plague and rations and high taxes and other kingdom-wide maladies. An entire kingdom held its breath in the hopes that the princess would be found and swiftly. The two ladies-in-waiting didn't believe for a single second that King Dave's simple-minded fourth daughter was that valuable to anybody, and guessed rightly since they'd been around her so often that she simply ran away. So they were still quietly cackling when the large bell in the clock tower began to peal out laborious chimes two weeks after Cynthia had disappeared. The crier wasn't far behind. It's her! She's back! She's back! The princess is back! She's all right! Servants poured into the hallways and out of the castle into the foyer as King Dad raced them all from his war room. And there she was, in the same nightgown she had on when she left. Soaking wet, though, as though she'd fallen into a large puddle or small pond, holding the reins of an enormous Clydesdale horse that no one had ever seen before. It, too, appeared to be drenched, as though they had just made it out of a summer downpour, although there were no storm clouds in the sky. Cynthia calmly handed the reins to a stable boy after affectionately caressing the jaw of her mount. Hang days the horse trotted away. She assessed the whispering slack jawed members of her father's castle and court and stated loudly in front of everyone The marriage is off. King Dad's jaw audibly popped open to the point his trusted Butler Gray felt it might have become unhinged accidentally. Before King Dad could even start spluttering at his willful daughter, Cynthia sneered at him instead. Here, you foolish old man, I have brought my own bride price. This should cover what you would have gained in the arrangement with that ingrate Jeffrey, who is about as intelligent as a potato, and would have held me hostage indoors for the rest of my life, the same way you tried to do to my mama, which is why she left and joined that convent in the first place. And Cynthia walked around, surmising the state, shaking her head as though incredibly disappointed. Mm -mm -mm. This will never do. When I am queen, we will have to make up for lost time. Look at this place. What a waste. And Cynthia shoved the sack of gold into King Dad's trembling hands and strode towards the castle, strewing water and wringing her hair out onto the cobblestone. But, but, King Dad stammered, trying to block her. You're number four. My name is Cynthia. Cynthia hissed at him. My mother gave me that name. She shoved her face not two inches from her father's, and she did not blink. And you disgusting old men with your bad brick and punchy bellies, ordering girls to sacrifice their bodies for your aggrandizement would do well to remember the power of a name given by a woman to a woman. That is the source of her strength. Woman? But you're... Well, you're just fifteen, King Dad stammered, but it came out sounding like a winded accordion whine. If I'm old enough to be trusted with the marriage and giving birth to children, then I'm old enough to learn how to run this kingdom, but not into the ground as you have done, which is why you need your daughters to marry strangers in the first place. My sisters are not here. I am, and I must clean up your mess as usual, now go play with your stupid coins and leave the business of ruling this kingdom to the new generation. <coughs> Gray! And she sidestepped King Dad and took a towel from a nearby servant who thought to hand her one, bowing deeply as she continued to dry her hair and disappeared around a corner. Gray looked at the aging King Dad and then gazed after Cynthia. Gray! 
She shrieked from inside the front doors. Gray hopscotched over King Dade immediately and disappeared after Cynthia like a mouse into its hole, leaving the monarch trembling with confusion and a hint of fear at the newfound strength of his most docile daughter with the dimple in her cheek like his and his eyes as the bell peeled on. And Eunice and Sylvie never said another word about Cynthia again to anyone, not even themselves. In the castle, they were split up, mostly because they were reassigned almost immediately to become washerwomen. Cynthia told them about their new appointment on opposite ends of the castle in the throne room one morning before meeting with her father's general, while King Dade fumed in the corner because no one was listening to him. Cynthia had instructed Gray to ensure her father's pipe stayed packed with hookweed to keep him quiet and out of trouble. After selecting new personal waitstaff to outfit her with a more mature wardrobe befitting a future queen, not merely a princess, fond of out-of-season figgy pudding, she told Eunice and Sylvie to report to laundry from now on. After all, she crooned, not sounding unlike a cat with a finch between its paws. As you both no doubt have recognized, I'm no longer a child, am I? Well, 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 the exchange man said, leaning over his counter. We meet again. What do you have for me today, neighbor? How much do you suppose this could go for? The customer was a tinker and a bit of a vagabond who only sought work when he was on the brink of going hungry for more than a few days. Otherwise, you could find him in a tavern in whatever town he woke up in. The tinker's name was Timothy. Timothy the Tinker, and he was holding up a bright gold heart-shaped locket for the exchange man to see. Few bits, sniffed the exchange man. Unlikely, Timothy said. It's real good quality, this is. Nicked it from a girl sleeping in a paddle boat. She looked like nobility. See this stone in the middle here? This is a genuine ruby, a nice engraving, Timothy said, turning the locket over says, to my dearest daughter, love Q. Q, the exchange man frowned. Q for queen. It's got a royal stamp. Let me see that. The exchange man turned the delicate chain over in his rough hands. Well, if it is from a royal, he said at last, I can't take it. The first place to look for something like this is my shop, and I'm much too fond of my neck to take the risk. You must know somebody then who might want to pay me what it's worth. Mm. The exchange man scratched his lumpy chin and searched the rafters. Nicodemus might take it off your hands. Who's he? Timothy asked excitedly. Alchemist, four blocks past the king's gate. The seedier said, has a stuffed rabbit sitting in the window. Much obliged, Timothy said as he waved goodbye and crossed the well-worn floor in a few steps. Don't suppose I can expect a finder's fee, the exchange man called after him, but Timothy had already left and was hustling down the street towards the king's gate, the seedier side. Not only did Nicodemus buy the locket and pay twice what the exchange man would have, but he told Timothy if he found any more that he would pay good money for such nice gold, which is exactly why Timothy stopped being Timothy the tanker and started being Timothy the jewel thief. But that's another story for another time. And anyway, he got caught at it eventually. Ended up doing a stint in the blood mines, and that seemed to cure him of his lack of self-discipline. But what of Cynthia? The girl whose locket had been stolen. 
who'd fallen face to sleep in a paddle boat while running away from home. Well, she didn't notice the locket her mother had given her wasn't around her neck when she woke up. It was dawn, and Cynthia certainly hadn't meant to fall asleep. The adrenaline and physical exertion must have worn her out, and although she knew that any minute there would be a search party looking for her, she was so famous she tore into her little cakes and flask of water as though she hadn't eaten in weeks. Before they realized she'd run away, all Cynthia had was at best 15 minutes to figure out which direction she wanted to head next. She was thinking her best option was to go to the same convent and seek asylum the way her mother had done. The pouch of coins tucked into her nightgown bodice should cover at least most of the way there. It seemed as good a plan as any to dedicate the rest of her life to the great mother. Much better odds of happiness they'd way than dedicating her life to Jeffrey. So it was decided. Cynthia removed her jacket and stepped out of the paddle boat, creating small ripples in the lake. It was shaping up to be a beautiful morning, and she felt freer than she had in a long time, with the dawn chorus bringing her next horizon to life. She would learn to become a woman of the cloth like her mother, and there was nothing King Dave could do about it. While bending over in the shallow part of the lake, splashing water hurriedly on her face because now knowing King Dave's tendency to overreact, Cynthia would have to outpace horses and hounds on foot. She paused, noticing an odd shape situated in the forehead of her reflection in the lake water. It sparkled and winked and glittered so prettily, like a purple jewel-toned flower, and was so lovely, Cynthia couldn't stop looking at it. She wanted to touch it. And without knowing what she was doing, really, she reached for the jewel blossom. Her fingers and her reflection's fingers met one another briefly before she plucked the jewel out of the water without thinking how odd it was that something so opulent was sitting in the muck of the shallow end of the lake. Examining the purple crystal out of the water, it looked like amethyst and appeared to glow in a regular rhythm as though it had a pulse. Cynthia didn't know that the jewel was attached to a thread similar to a fishing line, but made out of something much stronger and deadlier. Cynthia had plucked out of the lake one of the lures that belonged to a monster. A creature that had been exiled to that lake for a thousand years, long before King Dade's grandfather's grandfather had been born, before there was even a kingdom. Ancient, broad, and craven companionship. The monster's name was Cetus, and its crime was insatiable hunger. It had terrorized in its day thousands of shores, consuming whole seaside villages, luring fishermen and sailors down into the deep. Finally, the people petitioned the gods to confine Cetus to a single form and put it somewhere where it couldn't hurt anybody. Whole families were going missing, and that was getting quite inconvenient for civilization in certain parts of the world. No people, no worshippers, and so the gods agreed to treat Cetus as they would have a disobedient titan and cast it out, stripped the monster of its original form because they could do nothing about its greed, and stowed it somewhere where it would no doubt shrink and disappear without anyone to feast upon. And so Cetus remained exiled with only the form of a shadow. No body, really. Just its essence, drifting around like an oil spill on the surface of the lake overlooked by everyone. But enough time passed, and Cetus grew wise to the ways of people, as the gods of old who had sentenced it went one by one to take their long sleep. And as they slept, Cetus's strength returned, as did its consciousness. It could harvest body parts from other living things, mostly from the creatures in the lake, fish, eels, toads, turtles, and so it did, cobbling together a new skin for itself, eyes, webbed fingers, 
animating everything with what was left of its life force growing strange and something else entirely until the monstrosity Cetus would have been unrecognizable even to those who exiled it to the distant lake in the first place. At last, Cetus grew strong enough to leave the lake as most of the old gods were dead or asleep. But it needed a body, a full human body with all its locomotion intact to escape, and that required a very specific sort of hunt that involved conversation. The conjure would only work if it had a willing participant. They shouldn't be too difficult. Sometimes all you had to do was convince someone to be willing. But to get a whole body to wrap itself up in, Cetus would have to wait for the rat unsuspecting passerby to find one of its lures, and they took patience. Fortunately, Cetus knew most humans like shiny, glittery things. They go to war over them. They steal shiny, glittery things from one another all the time. They want to possess as many as possible. And that is what the creature was banking on with even a half-sized human with skin still so new. But this girl thing would want to know where the rest of the jewels were too, which were strewn like candy along the bank. Having watched Cynthia pick up the first jewel tone lure, Cetus lit another one up a foot away, further from the bank. This time, it was a verdant green like jade or emerald. Just past the first one, and it too flirted with Cynthia. So close, so close. All you have to do is reach. Oh, how it sparkled. And just as Cynthia bent to pick the new jewel up, another one. This time, hues of goldenrod and amber a few more steps further into the lake, and then another even further. They all descended like little lights down towards the center of the lake. They glowed and whispered, little lights lighting up a dark path. Oh, poor sweet gal Cynthia, so convinced she would go to a convent not six minutes before, with a bemused smile pressed little jewels to her chest that weren't really jewels, until her head slipped quietly beneath the surface of the lake. And oh, how the monster beneath grinned. Company's coming, Cetus said to nobody, and in a flurry of bubbles, heaved its huge serpentine body up from the shadows to go and net its catch. There was only one room in the palace the princess was not allowed to enter without an adult, and that was the vault where all her family's documents, heirlooms, and secrets were kept. All other rooms, stairwells and halls, libraries, studies, cellars, dungeons, observatories, and attic, even the kitchens and laundry rooms were available for her to explore, even if they were occupied by somebody who needed to get some work done. Her parents were the king and queen of Milestone, a quaint country east of Gladiola and north of Wellspring. The princess's name was Bucktooth, and it was bestowed upon her in infancy by a mischievous yellow pixie, along with the curse of a quite unfortunate overbat that would develop as Princess Bucktooth grew older. The pixie's name was Dandelion, 
and everyone knows yellow pixies are the worst to conjure and can often be found stealing pixie dust from others in order to create their glamours. But at the time, hundreds of years prior to these events, a yellow pixie was all their family could afford, and it was Dandelion's assignment to hex every other generation in this particular line despite their nobility, no matter who they were. It was all written down in a very old document kept secret in the family vault. The milestone monarchs would enjoy a steady increase in terms of wealth and abundance for each generation, as long as there were checks and balances. So Princess Bucktooth's hex was among many a similar outdated arrangement made in those days. It was the only way back then that heroes were made for men. Men needed lots of quests and curses and monsters to defeat to motivate them toward self-discipline and keep them from killing each other over border disputes. You could say that Princess Bucktooth then served quite a pivotal role in her family line. In fact, being hexed in her family came with a kind of notoriety. Everyone just knew that one day some handsome nobleman's son would come along and remove Dandelion's hex by giving Princess Bucktooth a new name. A name that matched who she truly was in terms of character. And yet another generation of milestone monarchs would be saved and live to rule another day. In fact, Princess Bucktooth's own grandmother, Queen Mirth, had had a hex placed on her too by Dandelion. Pixies are very long lived, you know. When she was still an infant, Princess Mirth had been hecked with an inability to keep from laughing at very sad things. And not only that, her laughter was contagious. She was literally cursed to laugh instead of weep. They had to keep the young Princess Mirth very far away from the palace infirmary along with funerals and people suffering from hardship who sought asylum in Milestone. The knight who saved Princess Mirth from her curse and later became her prince consort, taught her how to cry over happy things, like how beautiful a sunset can be, or a ballad, or a rose. And so naturally, she married him. So you see, in Milestone, curses and hexes were not to be ashamed of nor feared, but obstacles to be challenged by, conquered, and ultimately overcome on behalf of everybody. They represented a version of what everybody experiences from time to time, and in that sense, the monarchy who were hexed were seen as heroes. Because every time a curse was lifted, another generation of peace and prosperity filled the land. So Dandelion thought she'd mix it up a little bit. She made it so that Princess Bugtooth wouldn't want to be saved by anybody. She fixed the hex so that the princess liked her overback and didn't see the need to have anyone give her a new name. Do my teeth make a difference in how I think, Papa? She asked her father one night over spaghetti. It was Friday. They always hate spaghetti on Fridays. Well, no, of course not, my darling, he said slowly. Do my teeth not make me a princess, Mama? She asked the queen. Of course not, the queen snapped. She was rat fed up with her daughter's refusal to tow the line. Bucktooth was turning 16 at the end of July, and any day now a long line of suitors would be traveling from all over the country to win her hand and give her a new name. Then what difference does it make? Princess Bucktooth said happily and continued slurping spaghetti, dipping her toast points into the marinara. Dandelion, overhearing this conversation because occasionally she enjoyed poking her head in on the milestone monarchy to see how they were doing with her various enchantments, <laughs> giggled madly and flew off. Good luck with such a strong-headed princess, she thought to herself and chuckled over the king and queen's predicament the entire way back to the land of the fae. At this rate, Princess Bucktooth would never be willing to allow a hopeful knack anywhere near her, and Dandelion felt that the kingdom could use a generation or two of struggle so they wouldn't take their prosperity for granted. And anyway, Dandelion was running late for the annual pixie parade. She was supposed to help out with decorating one of the floats shaped like a unicorn. She'd been placed in charge of decorating the main. What are we supposed to do with her? The queen said later, pacing in front of the fireplace in their bedroom. Maybe we shouldn't have given her so much freedom to roam as a child, the king mused. She has no respect for our family's traditions, the queen fumed. Hundreds of years of peace and it's all about to go up in a burning haystack because your daughter thinks she looks fine and it's perfectly normal to go around with a name like Bucktooth. The king shook his head. This means that whoever her hero is will have his work cut out for him. Not only will he have to give her a new name to match her character, 
but he'll have to convince her to take a new name in the first place. I know, the queen lifted her head. Let's send her to the Great Mother's Convent over on the far west coast. Whatever for, dear, the king frowned. To teach her a little bit of respect for her station, that's what, the queen said, her mouth a thin line of determination. The sisters there can finish ironing out all those stubborn wrinkles and instill some modesty in her. It'll be like finishing school. Nothing like wearing a habit and having to pray four times a day and eating nothing but bread and water and the vegetables you garden to make you appreciate the luxury of freedoms you hate at home. I don't understand, Princess Bucktooth said the next morning when her parents informed her of the news. Am I being punished for some reason? No, no, the king told her. Your mother and I thought it would be best for a future queen to spend some time getting to know our country now while you're able to move more freely. You know, how people make a living who are not brought up in a palace. You'll be able to meet all sorts of pilgrims in the convent from all different walks of life and areas of the kingdom who come there for pilgrimages and whatnot. And maybe you'll learn a thing or two about propriety and servitude while in service to the great mother, the queen sniffed. Princess Bucktooth looked first at her mother and then at her father and realized that what her parents were saying was not a request. So she felt in that moment that they were giving her a bit of adult responsibility for the first time. After all, she would be representing her family at this convent, so the princess decided she would shift her perspective a bit and look at the time away as a field trip or play make-believe that she was going as an ambassador of their country to a foreign land somewhere she'd never been before. The convent was a long way from the palace, far past their country home, and she'd only ever been to the seaside with her parents before when she was very small and barely remembered the convent they spoke of, just the singing. This would be an adventure. All right, Princess Bucktooth nodded and went to pack her things. When she left, her parents sighed. Whew, they could have gone a completely different direction, the king said as he dabbed his brow with his handkerchief. Princess Bucktooth raised her hand. May I be excused? Mother, sister, head of the convent to the great mother, eyed the princess over her spectacles. For what purpose? I volunteered to make the evening tad offering for Sister Herman who had a migraine. The princess said, but it came out more like a question. The one thing she had learned at the convent was that mother, sister did not appreciate tardiness, truancy, or the shirking of one's chores or dishevelment of appearance in any way, shape, or form, as she felt in any sort of aberration that could be helped was offensive in the eyes of the great mother, who only created beautiful things. And the convent was beautiful. Not a petal was out of place anywhere. Sisters who had blemishes were ordered to cover them up with hoods and veils and extra layers, so everyone looked uniform in their habits in the name of devotion. Princess Bucktooth was immediately assigned a veil to cover her overback and referred to as Sister Becca instead of her given name. She was definitely not allowed to wander around the convent the way she had been in the palace, and when there were guests, people on pilgrimages, she was not permitted to speak lest someone ask her name and she forget that she wasn't Princess Bucktooth while she was there. The princess had never been made to feel outright embarrassed about her appearance or her name at home, so for the first time in her life, she learned shame, not modesty, the way her mother had intended. Oh, mother sister called this cruelty of forcing the women in her charge to cover up their blemishes, modesty, but that's not what it was. It was called prejudice. But Princess Bucktooth didn't get a say. Gone was her decision to pretend that she was a visiting dignitary in a foreign country, and in its place she felt more like something held in captivity. She did her chores diligently, learned to sweep and mop and scrub dishes, how to plant and harvest vegetables from the garden, how to make bread, how to embroider, although she was only able to do the one stitch over and over again, and how to sing the shapeless, wordless hymns at a devotion to the Great Mother. 
Her birthday was approaching in one month, and while Bucktooth's letters to her parents spoke of how much she was learning from not just the sisters in the convent who dedicated the entirety of their lives to worship, but the people who came from all over the kingdom to bring gifts to the Great Mother in exchange for her blessing. The princess hinted more than once that she couldn't wait to be back at home in her own bed again, and that she very much admired the devotion of Mother, Sister, and the others, but after all, she wasn't one of them. But every time a letter returned from her parents, all oh, they talked about were how many suitors were already arriving from all over Milestone, and how many of them had already thought of some beautiful names for their daughter. A front-runner in the Queen's estimation was from Lord Carmody's son, Edward, who'd recently been knighted and had chosen the name Wilhelmina for Bucktooth, which meant protection. When that letter came, the princess toasted aside with the others just like it on the little desk in her cell. There was no real privacy in the convent, and someone was always watching. So the seashore had become Princess Bucktooth's refuge, and she spent hours watching the hypnotic tide swell and retreat, sniffling, feeling a little sorry for herself on account of the fact she had to wear that stupid dummy veil that was given to her with the express purpose of hiding her overback. The veil frequently sat and watered up like kelp in her lap so sand wouldn't get on it. Once the princess figured out that one of the vows the sisters in the convent had made was to take a morning and evening offering to the great mother on behalf of everybody, which involved making a loaf of sweet bread and carrying it down to the shore, lighting a candle and saying a prayer, the princess made it her personal mission to be the one they sent as often as possible. And once the other sisters, many of them just as old as mother, sister, or older, realized that Princess Bucktooth would take the offering for them, since the shore was such a nuisance to get to, with so many other chores to perform throughout the day, they gladly allowed her to step in on their behalf. So, when Princess Bucktooth asked Mother Sister to be excused from copying down script from the Gospels of the Great Mother onto fresh parchment, she lowered her eyes and clasped her hands, and appeared extra demure and modest, the quintessence of a novitiate. Tell me, Sister Becca, Mother Sister said, rolling up her own scroll. What do you pray for? Beg pardon, Mother Sister? When you make your prayers to the Great Mother, what do you pray for? Peace and milestone, of course, Mother Sister. Yes, but most people tend to throw in a personal request. What do you pray for, Sister Becca? Princess Bucktooth felt that this was a trick question, so she said, I pray for the Great Mother to heal my... She swallowed, lying. To heal my condition, she went on, and to send somebody to give me a new name by my next birthday. Mother sister nodded. That's what I thought. It's all right as long as it's not vanity, princess. As long as you praying with the mind towards the perfection that the great mother asks us to aspire that she herself created and that men have ruined. Sister Becca, we must always turn our heads away from what is unsightly and pursue grace despite the nature of the flaws in our corpus. Yes, Mother Sister, Princess Bucktooth felt the prickling of tears beneath her eyelids but stared at the floor. No one had ever called her ugly before. You may go, Mother Sister said. Princess Bucktooth fled from the convict walls with her basket of sweet bread and her candle and barely able to see she was crying so hard. And just in case anyone was looking, she climbed to the usual place atop the prayer rock to make her offering that overlooked the sea and flung the bread and the candle into the waves. There's her stupid offering, you stupid, stupid great mother! Princess Bucktooth sobbed. I'm not ugly or unsightly, and even if I am, it's not my fault. I was cursed, you hear me? I was hexed by a pixie that you made, so why am I being punished for something you created? It's not like my teeth or my name were my idea. <laughs> and she collapsed onto the sand, sobbing angry hot tears that streamed down her cheeks like rain down a window pane. I hate, I hate it here, she shrieked, and I hate, I hate Mother Sister. My name is not Sister Becca, it's Princess Bucktooth. Princess Bucktooth jumped up and down on the prayer rock as though she meant to break it to pieces, and the sea 
said nothing back to her, just accepted the sweet bread as always, the candle that was meant to be lit and prayed and sung over, and Princess Bucktooth's dismay. But someone did hear the princess, although it wasn't the great mother, and as the princess stormed back up to the convent, wiping her eyes and coughing and hiccuping the whole way, a webbed pair of hands spread themselves over the prayer rock where the princess had just been stomping her heart out, and a head lifted above the surface of the foamy salt water slowly to reveal hair that looked as though it were made of kelp and sea grapes, and eyes that were large and fathomless as a blue hole, but sharp as an eel's. They didn't blink as they watched the princess run away from the shore. It was a water woman who'd heard Princess Bucktooth pour her heart out to nobody but the sea. Ah, the water woman's voice sounded like sea-worn glass. Companies come in. Did you bring it? The water woman slid herself up onto the rocks inside the little tadpole cave below the convent to the great mother. Her eyes were greedy and her webbed fingers spread and groped the shadows. Yes, I did, but first give me what you promised, the princess told her firmly. I'll not be tricked again into giving you something for nothing. That's how I got this, remember? And she pointed at the cruel puckered scar that ran from her elbow to her wrist. If one of the pilgrims hadn't been a physician, I could have died I lost so much blood. He said I'm lucky I can still use my hand at all. That's how close the wound was to a nerve. The water woman's gills flared briefly out of annoyance, but she spat a long stream of seawater that landed at the princess's feet. A thin gold chain was in the center, and the princess picked it up and took her time untangling it. She nodded and tossed a pouch at the water woman, who shrieked with delight. It might be a little stale, the princess warned her. Christmas was last month. That's how long it took to get back here from visiting my parents. The water woman was already tearing into the pouch and breaking off great hunks of figgy pudding and cramming them into her mouth, the crumbs falling into the tadpole. Slow down or you won't even be able to taste it, the princess commented, watching the water woman wolf down the cake like someone who hadn't eaten in a very long time. Good, good. The water woman said, chewing, and the princess marveled over the needle-like teeth, so like a fish's, slashing through the cake like a serrated knife through putty. At last, the dessert finished, the water woman wiped her mouth and burped unceremoniously. She relaxed and held her stomach, patting it, smiling something that seemed for the first time since they met eighteen months prior almost human. This year, the princess would turn eighteen and to her parents' dismay, never returned to the palace except for holidays. Hundreds of disappointed suitors had to go back to their homes bereft of the opportunity to rule Milestone, since the princess decided to instead dedicate her life to the great mother until she made peace with her parents. Only then would she return to take up her rightful status as princess. Until then, she would even learn to stomach the name Sister Becca, even Dandelion the Yellow Pixie could not have anticipated this turn of events, and there was no way around it, although the king and queen begged her to amend the curse so that self-acceptance would free the princess, but they wouldn't work. Someone else had to give her a new name that reflected her true self, and it couldn't be the princess herself. Additionally, conflict and milestone was supposed to follow should the princess not be freed from the hex, but there was one loophole, an oversight, no time limit. Tradition asserted that by the 16th birthday of the hexed individual, they would be freed from the curse and prosperity would remain in the land because that's how it had always been done. But the princess chose to spend her 16th birthday at the convent, which is when she met the water woman. She'd been allowed to roam the seashore for one full day without chores as a birthday gift from Mother Sister. And about a week after that, with everyone holding their breath, 
nothing disastrous had befallen anyone in the palace or in Milestone for that matter, so they consulted Dandelion in the original documents in the vault. Well, Dandelion has said, hovering over the king and queen's shoulders, they were all three frowning, and Dandelion's wings whirred like a hummingbird's dropping glitter and pixie dust onto the parchment with the original hex. Technically, she could go the rest of her life and not change her name or anything, but if she dies before she's given a new one that reflects who she truly is, then strife will surely follow. But, the king said, his eyes widening, that gives us more time. He certainly does, Dandelion admitted, unhappy about being outwitted by her own loophole. So we're saved, the queen rejoiced. For now, the yellow pixie shrugged. Better keep an eye on her, though. Once word gets out about the loophole, we'll just say somebody won't kidnap her for ransom. The king and queen immediately ordered a full retinue of armed guards to the convent, and there they stayed until the princess should decide she'd made peace with her appearance to the point she could return and receive a new name. No one was allowed in or out of the convent, not even the pilgrims, without being patted down, questioned, and in some cases subjected to a full cavity search. Word spread about how the seaside convent was becoming quite unhospitable to pilgrims, and so many of them opted for the mountain convent instead on the other side of the country, which meant fewer tides came in, and even mother sister cautioned the princess at that point against pride. But the princess had made up her mind. No, no, you're right, mother sister, she said one morning, feeling refreshed from working in the garden and wiping her brow. There is freedom and restraint. And from then on, the princess became the quintessence of modesty and very much rose to the challenge of becoming Sister Becca. And nobody could fault her for her devotion to the great mother. Within a year, Mother Sister had announced her retirement and that she'd received new orders from the Great Mother to step down and make her way to the mountain convent herself for her own pilgrimage. The priests there were already expecting her and four of the elder sisters made the choice to go with her. A new Mother Sister had not been appointed yet, but little changed in the convent's daily functions with the exception of five of their order were no longer in their cells, so chores had to be redistributed. To Sister Becca's delight, she was given the task of eating an offering every evening, and so she was able to spend ample time by the sea without her veil, doing whatever she wanted. After all, there was no more mother-sister to run away from. Sister Becca often visited with the water woman and learned much about the sea from her stories of storms and sailors, and received a new education about Milestone from the perspective of one of its citizens that nobody actually knew about. While the water woman was nebulous about her own origins, she had much to say about the carrion zone of humans and how savage they become, how wasteful, how greedy for the bounty of the sea, how so many places were being overfished, and how many creatures were hunted for their fiends or other body parts, how people in their carelessness were hurting the sea, and while charting new territories and conquering new lands, they were slowly and steadily overturning the cycles and rhythms of the natural world. The water woman spoke of ancient remnants of creatures from creation who were on the cusp of being woken up again by the warish ways of humanity and how there lurked mutants in the deep who cobbled themselves together over time that would one day rise like titans from the shallows, which is what she called the seashore, and take their revenge on humans. Sister Becca listened to all of this aghast, and these stories were the real reason she did not want to return to the palace. The more she knew, the more she wanted to know, but every story came with a price, a trade. First, the water woman wanted to taste the sweetbread that Sister Becca brought down for the evening offerings. Then, she wanted to see what flowers looked like from inside the convent. Then she wanted to know what earrings were. She'd heard about women who pierced their ears for the sake of adornment. Then she wanted shoes. Although she had a great tail herself, she just wanted a pair and wore them on her webbed hands when Sister Becca brought them, clip-clopping them on the prayer rock, laughing at how ridiculous people were. There were times when Sister Becca thought that the water woman was her only friend in the whole world. But there were other times that it was clear the guild siren was not to be trusted entirely, like the last time. 
and then trying to explain the whole business with the curse and how her teeth were seen as ugly amongst humans is pointless. The water woman scoffed, bearing her own needle-like teeth, which would no doubt have horrified Mother Sister. Can you eat with them? Yes, but that's not the point, Sister Becca told the water woman. What is point? The point is, if I don't find a way to do something about them, my hex will infect everyone in my family in the whole kingdom. The water woman considered this. Trade. Now's not a good time for a story I have to pack. I'm to go see my parents for Christmas. Trade, the water woman hate insisted. Sister Becca said, all right, what is it this time? Bring me dessert. Do what? I have heard of something called dessert. I should like to try it. Huh, Sister Becca said. You've never had dessert before? The water woman shook her head no. I guess not. They don't even have dessert in the convent. All right, but it better be a good story. Not story this time. Fix. And she pointed at her teeth and then at Sister Becca. Wait, what? I, water woman. Yes, Sister Becca said slowly. I have conjured like Pixie. What? I fix hex on teeth. Bring dessert. Sister Becca jumped up in astonishment and the veil fell from her lap. You've been able to fix my hex this whole time without a new name or anything? The water woman shrugged. You have new names, Sister Becca. Wait, that's, that's not my new name. That's who you say your new name is. But you say I'm Sister Becca. But the great mother gave you this name. This name power. No, no. Mother Sister called me that name when I first got here, the princess argued. Mother, sister, not speak for great mother? Well, she does. She did. The princess's eyes widened. <gasps> she gave me a new name, and, and, and she wasn't a knight or a prince. That's not your name, but it's your name now. And look, you stay with great mother. Oh, my word. The princess mumbled to herself. The pixie never said it had to be a name I liked. But it isn't enough to ensure my house don't be safe because I still don't feel like a sister yet, which means I'll have to really be a true sister. I have to really accept this name and accept myself as Sister Becca. She's right. The great mother would have given me the name through Mother Sister. But it has to be both. I still have my overback, or I'm still cursed. The water woman yawned, not following a word of this. So, you bring dessert? Done. And that was how the princess found herself tossing a pouch of slightly stale figgy pudding to the water woman a month after Christmas in exchange for a delicate gold chain spat out at her feet that she was supposed to wear until her teeth changed into something more presentable. You're sure this will work? Sister Becca aced the water woman undoing the clasp and winding the thin gold around her collarbone before clasping it again. Worked for me. The water woman smiled widely, revealing again her needle-like fish's teeth, and sank into the shadowy cave waters without creating even so much as a ripple. Sweet nothing, sweet love, sweet nothing, sweet Company's coming, the old man said to the intimate group in front of him. 
He had dark skin like his people before him and was in many ways starting to resemble his own elders these days in both appearance and temperament. Wiry steel gray hairs were now quite pronounced in his curly beard and the hair that was left in a half halo around his head. You couldn't see where he was bald though at the moment because he wore a straw hat to cover it up. The hat was painted red on one side and black on the other so if you were sitting to his right you'd think he was wearing a red hat. If you were sitting to his left, you'd think it was black. The old man's name was Jericho. He had another name, but Jericho was what he went by in Clay People Country, which is where this story takes place. Clay People Country is somewhere that has become largely dormant where Conjure is concerned. With the exception of a few lace practitioners here and there, I mean real Conjure. Not like what you see these days on a TV. I mean people who understand the invisible as much as they understand the visible. It makes sense to them, the alignment of the cosmos and natural world. And they know how it all connects and don't try to mess with the setup too often. Just a little bit of realignment every now and then, like what a chiropractor might do for someone whose spine needs to be readjusted when there's a kink in it. Yes, true conjure folk are mighty rare in clay people country, and so the people gathered around the table with Jericho, and Jericho himself had to be careful, even with names. Who is it this time? Sister Alma said, peering over her spectacles at him. She too was an older woman with skin the color of almonds. Her hair was long and white and hung down her back in thin ropes, tied away from her face with two of the ropes into a simple knot. It's my granddaughter, Jericho told everybody. They looked at him. How did she? The fella to his right started to ask. He would have seen mostly the red of Jericho's hat, and at first glance he too appeared as dark-skinned as Jericho until he leaned forward into the light hanging above the kitchen table. On second glance you'd see that this man's skin was not skin at all, but the bark of a linden tree. His head was crowned in dark green leaves, and tightly knit clusters of white and yellow blossoms poked out among them because it was summer and he was in bloom. That person's name was George, and he was a dryad. Sister Alma was a sylphid, if you must know, and that meant she had a very high-ranking position where they all came from. The title doesn't matter much to anyone in clay people country, but for whatever it's worth, Sister Alma could transform herself into a horned owl at will. But she never allowed any of the clay people to see this occurrence. Either they saw her as they saw themselves, just another clay person, or they saw her as an owl at night, hunting field mice in the woods or sitting in a tree branch, her head swiveling around and round at the surround sound of dusk chorus. But as you might expect, clay people would not have made the connection between the owl and the person. As I've mentioned, clay people country was pretty bereft at this point in terms of conjure. Even their imaginations had gone limp in the what-if department. They swiped George and Sister Alma, and one other individual not present at the moment, but we'll get to him later, had come up to Clay People Country to find in the first place. They were looking for talent, for lack of a better way to put it. Got in the same way the first one did, Jericho told them, as though it couldn't be helped through the always door. She's already met Lila. That was Jericho's second wife's name, who was just as mythological as the rest of their company, as she was a nimbus, which is a type of water sprat you don't hear about very often anymore. Sister Alma took her spectacles off and folded them, closing her eyes wearily. This is very inconvenient. If she stays, she's going to need a tour guide. I know we're all very busy. As a precaution, I already talked to himself about it, Jericho said. He said he'd give her the tour if she wants one eventually. What's her name? George asked, leaning back. After all, it couldn't be helped. Bethany, Jericho said. She thinks I'm dead. Thinks I passed on up here in Clay People Country somewhere and just didn't come home. She's the owner of this house, technically, but they put it in something called a conservatorship until she's old enough to own it, I guess. Bethany, George repeated. Clay People name? Sister Alma asked him. You could do worse, Jericho said, shrugging. Hey, I have a clay people name, George said. That's because you used to be a clay people and you are much too sentimental, Sister Alma rolled her ass. Does she know about the trade? George asked Jericho instead of arguing. The kitchen light made his luminous yellow eyes glow and they appeared larger than they actually were. No, Jericho said. 
They fell silent again. Doesn't she know what she is? Sister Alma pressed him after a long minute. She's never needed to know before now. She's just a youngling. Like most of them, she'll outgrow her interest. All this will fade into a dream when she starts high school in the fall. What if it doesn't? Sister Alma said, sounding cross. It will, Jericho insisted. It'll pass. It's just a phase that young people sometimes go through up here, they saw. She'll barely remember any of it a year from now with homework and band practice and homecoming and exams and what all else they do to torture the young minds up here these days. Or she'll get herself a little boyfriend or something and he's all she'll be thinking of instead of what she's seen down in door. The kitchen door opened and a very tall, very shaggy person with matted black fur ducked his head in. His name was Harkness and he was a safe squoach. Sorry I'm late, he said, sitting on one of the kitchen chairs. He winced a little as the chair creaked under his weight. Somebody almost saw me. I had to take the long way. What'd I miss? The clay people got in again. Sister Alma looked pointedly at Jericho. Who was it this time? His granddaughter, George told the safe squoach. Bethany. Harkness's broad face turned into a grin. Why, this wonderful Papa Leg... Uh, uh. Jericho stopped him. Jericho, if you please. There's ears everywhere up here, even at Terrapin Place. Of course, Mr. Jericho, sir, but aren't you thrilled? I mean, that counts as an heir. You can teach her everything, and then you can go take your long sleep. Jericho sighed and shook his head. No, no, I gotta stay up until we sort through this clay people problem. They keep getting in. There are too many down there already. I'm going to have to move the door. Again. How about in the lake? Sister Oma said. George nodded. If you move the door in the lake, Bethany won't be able to get back in unless she learns how to dreamwalk or something, and that takes care of that little problem. Gives us more time to study the clay people up here, too. They all looked at the older man in the black and red hat. I suppose you're right, Jericho said at last. It's not time. Not her world, after all. Don't worry, Sister Alma patted him on the arm. It's not if, it's when your heir will come. Miss Clay, Professor Strident called on the student whose hand was eagerly waving in front of her. Those are leaf galls, Bethany said, looking at the image being projected at the front of the classroom. They look worse than they are, but it's just a leaf's way of showing where the damage has been done by an insect of some sort from feeding or laying eggs. It's not actually a symptom of the entire tree being sick, but too many, and you need to start looking into controlling the population of leaf-feeding insects. Such as? Oh, Bethany faltered, thinking, um, could be caterpillars. Miles prompted her to save his friend. She threw him a grateful look. Right, Bethany said, and laying eggs could be anything from wasps to aphids, depending on the species of tree, of course, she concluded. Professor Stratton nodded, satisfied, then glanced at the clock above the door and walked over to flip the fluorescent lights back on. Exam on Friday, people, she said. Closed book test. Bring a number two pencil. She lifted her voice over the 30-some undergraduate students already shoving their books and notebooks into backpacks. Anyone who gets lower than a B- minus will not be permitted to start field work with the rest of the class next Wednesday. Be prepared to identify types of trees based on leaf sheep coloration and epidermal pattern. Thanks, Bethany said to Miles as they walked out into the hallway. Sure, he said. Off the lab with Dr. Woofus, Bethany laughed. You mean Dr. Rufus? And all with sad burns like that, they look like cocker spaniel ears. I'm surprised he doesn't trip over them. Miles grinned at her over his shoulder. Meet you after to study for Friday. Bethany waved at Miles and headed back to her dorm. If she timed it right, she could squeeze in about an hour of shut-eye before her roommate Antonia came in tripping all over everything on her side of the room, popping gum and posting up to laugh loudly on the phone all night. Bethany tried to remember this was part of college life, but she was very much looking forward to junior year where she could finally move out of the dorm and get her own apartment. I'm afraid the restrictions are quite stringent on this point, Miss Clay, the attorney said, scratching his nose. The summer pollen count was at an all-time high. Is doctor, 
Bethany told him, absently scrutinizing the document he'd handed her. Beg pardon? She looked up. It's not miss, it's doctor. Oh, of course. Dr. Clay. Physician, is it? The attorney, whose name was McCullough, didn't appear too certain. Tree doctor, she said. Oh, well, anyway, it says here that the property in your granddad's house was bought by a Sweet Creek about 15 years ago when it went unclaimed after his passing. I thought it was put into a conservatorship and that I was supposed to receive the deed on my 21st birthday. Pending court approval on the designated date. See here? McCullough pointed at a date in tiny print towards the end of the document. Bethany sighed. Oh, nobody ever showed up to claim it. My mother, she must have not known when the paper trail is quite extensive. They tried many times to reach her or someone in her family. We moved around a lot, Bethany explained. Late as it may be, the home and estate went into foreclosure and the town snapped it up. It's a historical site now. It's one of the only stops on the Underground Railroad in this area, so it's protected by the federal government and no one can tear it down or change the original architecture. Well, that's something at least. I'm happy to take you down if you like on my way to my 1130, he said in a voice that sounded more like that was the least possible thing he would want to do. It's all right, Bethany stood. She couldn't stand lawyers for longer than absolutely necessary, even small-town lawyers. It's like they all had to pass a smugness exam in addition to the bar in order to practice. I know the way, she said, and thanked him for his time. I wish I were a mermaid. Twyla told her reflection in Terrapin Lake, which was not far from behind Sweet Creek High's stadium. No, you don't, Holly said, shifted her position so the sun would be sure to catch the sun in. She'd sprayed into her hair before they went to lay out. Having to catch and eat raw fish? Swimming around in filthy water like this all the time? Fingers always wrinkled, hair always tangled, and no way to comb it? No back-to-school parties, no homecoming. Gills? Ew! She counted off all the reasons why being a mermaid would be a terrible idea. The two girls were on a short pier, idly wondering where their summer had gone. Holly on a beach towel and sunglasses, a bikini top and short shorts, and Twyla in her overall cutoffs and Care Bears t-shirt, letting her bare feet drift in the water, her grubby chucks stacked next to her. School started in two weeks. Holly had already been to the mall twice to pick out her first day of school outfit. They were going to be sophomores, which is where the fun really started in high school. No longer freshmen, friends they made last year, now upperclassmen. This was their first step to becoming grown-ups. In another year, they'd be driving to school and picking up part-time hours at a job. Holly couldn't wait, she was so excited. Her parents had extended her curfew to 10 p.m. on weekends, and she often vetted with Twyla who her first boyfriend was going to be out of the lineup of eligible bachelors among their classmates at Sweet Creek. She'd settled on... Howie Muggins, mostly because he was going to be a junior this year and she'd be able to go to prom. And Holly felt that he was cute, but not to the point that he was aware of it. He played baseball so he wouldn't have to worry about concussions like some of the football players. His dad owned a repair store for computers and made Howie work during the summer so he had his own money and could take her out to movies in the mall and the local diner and buy her presents for special occasions. It was a bonus that their first names sounded alike. Howie and Holly, Holly and Howie, Mrs. Holly Muggins. That was what she doodled on her list of back-to-school supplies. Holly had become what some mothers in Sweet Creek might call boy crazy. Others might have called her fast. That's the kind of town Sweet Creek was. A lot of mothers shaking their heads over their daughters and daughters' best friends who would one day replace them the same way they had replaced the women who came before them. Twyla didn't bring up wanting to be a mermaid again, but she still thought it on occasion, even after school started. She missed those long summer days at the lake as Holly dragged her around like a stuffed animal to all of the major events and a few basement parties while somebody's parents weren't home, where Twyla just stood there not knowing what to say to anyone next to the table with chips and sodas, watching her classmates grinding up on one another and making out in the corners. Holly was a champion kisser, apparently. She ditched the idea of Howie Muggins almost immediately because he kissed like a dead fish and instead started flirting with the new boy who just moved to Sweet Creek, Jasper Sutherford, and it was his name instead of Howie's she started doodling on her class assignments. Mrs. Holly Sutherford. 
Jasper's mother was making him take classes at the local community college in biology and chemistry. She wanted him to be a doctor and go to a good school. If me and Jasper get together, Holly told Twyla, we can go to the same university and get married after we graduate before we start to have a family. I want two boys, one girl, a toy poodle, a four-bedroom house. We'd be able to afford all of that on what he brings home being a doctor. I hope he's a pediatrician and doesn't turn out to want to be a dentist or something. Everybody likes a pediatrician. Nobody likes a dentist. Twyla didn't want to ruin her friend's daydream, but Holly was leaving out one very important detail. She'd have to make good enough grades to get into any college at this point to say nothing of one that Jasper might be accepted into. At the rate her semester exams were going, Holly was going to end up a fifth-year senior. Everything all right in there? Aunt B tapped lightly on the bathroom door. Twyla jumped. Yeah, be right out. She couldn't believe what she was seeing. All she'd done was run water over her hand from the tap like she was supposed to for a few minutes, according to the instructions inside the box the necklace had come with. You were supposed to immerse yourself in the element you most wanted to belong to and then concentrate on whatever or whoever it was you wanted to become while wearing the necklace. Now look at her hand. A thin membrane of skin had grown between each of her fingers to create webbing, like a frog's hand. I'm heading out to Breathwaite's for some samples. Get dinner started? Okay, Twyla said, feeling her voice might have become too high-pitched. She waited for Aunt B's footsteps to fade and cut the tape holder off. Instantly, the webbing between her fingers dissolved back into her skin and her hand looked perfectly normal again. Twyla caught her own eye in the bathroom mirror and was stunned to see her eyes changing back to their normal brown. She was certain that her irises had been yellow or gold not a moment before and very large. Small flaps that had gaped open on either side of her neck were already retreating back into skin as though they'd never appeared at all. Twyla touched the place where the gills had appeared horrified. They had felt so real, too real. Back in her bedroom, Twyla snatched the necklace out that she'd been wearing and all but threw it back into the box she bought it in a few days ago, breathing heavily. She was afraid if she didn't comb her breast, she would start to hyperventilate. Twyla lay on her bed, staring up at the ceiling, willing her pulse to relax. When her heart rate finally slowed to a more sedate pace, Twyla reasoned with herself. She'd been studying too hard for finals. They saw she was just stressed between studying and having to be a shoulder to cry on over Holly's breakup with Jasper and now putting in a few part-time hours at Mr. Jenkins' grocery on top of helping Aunt B renovate Terrapin Place. They saw that had been the webbing and, and flaps of skin, a mild hallucination brought on by stress. Twyla sat up and carefully put the box with the gold chain away at the bottom of her junk drawer in her desk, behind the broken stapler, her fifth grade diary, and the photo of her parents when she was still a baby, before the accident, and went down to get dinner started. No need to worry. Everything would level out after finals, and then there were the holidays to look forward to. So then what happened? Twyla asked what appeared to be an oil slick floating on top of the water. The slick was almost opaque black with streaks of iridescence and moved seamlessly with each ripple of terrapin lake that the breeze created. The fish swam around it and Twyla couldn't see her reflection when she bent over it to speak. The thing had told her its name was Cetus. Trade, Cetus said. Not this time. Tell me what you know, she insisted. No trade, no story. It sounded like the oily splotch had shrugged. Then we're done here, I guess. And Twyla stood and dusted off her overall cutoffs. It was summer again. Holly had gone away to visit her cousins in Scotland and wouldn't be back until school started. Twyla missed her friend, even with the incessant babbling about boys and parties and clothes. Holly had been her only consistent company in Sweet Creek. And summers meant endless days of hanging out at Terrapin Lake and daydreaming about... All the adventures they'd had when they were old enough to leave the small town and get an apartment together in the city. Holly would have been the first person Twyla confided in had she been there about the ink-colored splotch floating in the lake water they could speak. 
Let me see the necklace again. See this objected? You can see it, but that's all, Twyla told it. Fine, fine. The oil splotch bobbed up and down on the surface of the lake. Twyla turned and removed the chain and dangled it above the water. Cetus sounded like it sighed. It had no arms to reach for the thing it most coveted, only a few inches away. But it tried anyway. The oil slick appeared to lift itself above the surface of the lake water. Well, are you going to finish? Twyla asked, snatching the necklace back and quickly refacing it around her neck. Too tired now. Come back later, Cedar said, pouting. No, Twyla said firmly. I didn't come all the way out here to knock in anything. If you don't finish the story, then I won't come back at all. Cedar paused, but then it vanished and then began to speak. The contract permits one soul to wear the necklace at a time. That one belonged to a wood nymph named Harmonia. When someone puts Harmonia's necklace on, whatever they so wishes to become is possible for them. A to price. They can look however they want, as becoming, or as horrid, or as dangerous as they would like, in whatever shape they desire. But the change is irreversible. The necklace binds the water to that form. They cannot ever go back to who they were before, even after they take it off. The only way to change forms again is to make another wish on the necklace. The necklaces were not made for people. People are careless, greedy, insatiable in their desires with their short lives and short-sightedness. Yes, yes, I know all that, Twilight interrupted before Cetus could go off on another diatribe about the ills of humanity. What she really wanted to know was why the changes in her didn't appear to be permanent. She could shift back and forth between what Cetus called a clay people, or human, and something else. A changeling? A water woman? A mermaid? Twyla sat back down on the little pair, staring intently into the water at the inky shape. What happened to Cynthia? Cynthia, the second to youngest daughter of a king who ran away from home because she didn't want to be married. I lured her beneath the water. I held her in a cave below a lake similar to this one and told her she would never see daylight again if she didn't give me her body. She was unexpectedly strong for someone so young. She closed her mind to me. She resisted me, fought me, said she needed to live to see her mother again, though I promised her all the gold I'd hidden in that cave if she would give me her body. Then someone came. A mermaid? A changeling, Cetus corrected. She was looking for a way to lift a curse, a hex placed on her family by one of the fae. She too had once been a princess. She too had run away from a convent. She got into the cave through a door much like the one I came through to be here, the door that you now seek. She was wearing harmonious necklace. I recognized it. No mortal life is meant to sustain its power for that long. The changes in her had become irreversible. They'd made her strange. No telling what she'd been living off of or how long she'd been that way. She was no longer recognizable as a clay people. Like me, she needed a new body. But unlike me, she had nothing to purchase it with except for harmonious necklace. And you think this is that same necklace, the one I got from the antique store? Twyla said and looped the thin gold links around her index finger. I'd know it anywhere, Sita said. I was there when it was forged along with two other artifacts, three unique objects to serve as punishment for those who betrayed the old gods, much like the Titans, befitting the nature and degree of their deceit. With Harmonia's necklace, I wouldn't need someone else to host me. I could conjure a body of my own with my will. I could be free. But, Twyla said, thinking aloud, if I traded the necklace in exchange for you telling me where the door is beneath this lake, how do I know you won't be lying? There's another way, Sita said after a long moment. Well, I could show it to you. I could... Take you there myself, and then you give me the necklace before you pass through the door. We go our separate ways. You yourself have already become changeling like the one who helped Cynthia. You wouldn't need the necklace on the other side of the door, and to keep it any longer would mean you too would run the risk of becoming altered beyond recognition in both body and mind. Twyla paused. 
Finally, she was making some headway with Cetus. All she'd hate to do was remain firm while bargaining with it no matter how badly she wanted to know more. But she didn't trust the creature. Everything it told her was tainted by the fact that it wanted her necklace more than anything, so it'd say anything to get it. When, she said finally, come back in a month's time. The blood moon, the door will open again, the creature said, and then the inky iridescent splotch on the surface of the lake dissolved in front of her as though it had never appeared at all. But if they drained the lake, Twyla was saying, they were having spaghetti. They always had spaghetti on Fridays. What's going to happen to all the fish? They'll be relocated to private ponds, probably. The mature base, for instance, they, they can salvage once they check out and make sure they're not carriers of anything that's killing the trees. There's another large lake east of here in Fairfield County, and some of them will most likely go to the river. Aunt B said, scooping more marinara onto her plate. Paste the Parmesan? Twyla handed her aunt the grated cheese in a small dish and idly twirled her noodles with a fork. So what does that mean for us? I mean, for the house. It's mostly the town's job to do all that. I guess they just wanted the perks of just being the caretaker rather than the owner. I still get to live in my granddad's house and oversee the restoration, but the town's got to do all the maintenance on the land and foot the bill. Of course, the trees that use that lake as a water source will have to all be uprooted, and that's where I come in. They're sick. I've never seen anything like it, Twyla. Honestly, I don't think you should go down there anymore until we can figure out what's causing the vegetation to rot and some of those species of fish to go belly up. Okay, Twyla said. What about the extra water? Where does that go? Well, once it's been tested for parasites, it'll probably need to be filtered, and then it'll probably go a long way around town because of the drought. We'll use it for irrigation, I suppose. There might still be a little pond's worth left, but I'm hoping that the town will decide maybe to turn the lake bed into a reforestation project. Can they do that? Sure, happens all the time when we leave nature alone. Sometimes lakes drain naturally all by themselves. When do they start? Tomorrow, Aunt B said around a mouthful of garlic bread. Why this sudden interest in the lake? Well, Holly will want to know all about it. It's our spot in the summertime. Oh, they swear, Aunt B nodded. How is Holly, anyway? How's Scotland? I haven't really heard very much since she got there, the time difference and everything, but she says she sent me a postcard when she got some free time. She's working on her cousin's farm or something. Aunt B laughed. Holly playing old MacDonald? I would almost pay money to see that. Twyla smiled. Yeah. Oh, one more question about them draining the lake. Shoot, Aunt B said. What if they find something down there? Like what? I don't know, like artifacts or fossils or something from back in the day. Like a body, Aunt B said and wiggled her eyebrows. No, Twyla blushed and then... Well, what if they did find somebody's bones? Holly always says she thought the lake felt haunted. Well, that's for the sheriff's department to worry about. Guess we'll cross that bridge if we get to it, Aunt B told her. Are you going to eat that last piece of garlic bread? Twyla absently handed her aunt the plate with the remaining piece of bread and decided to not mention anything about the lake being drained to the parasite who called itself Cetus and swore it'd been around since antiquity, trapped in what looked to be an oil spill for all the time by the gods. Odds were that Cetus would be sucked up with the rest of the lake that it was poisoning just by dwelling in the waters. Twyla wound her spaghetti tightly around her fork. Either way, with the lake being drained, Cetus would probably be hosed up and deposited elsewhere, which meant she could find the door on her own. She could probably walk right up to it when it appeared again. All she had to do was wait for the next blood moon. The changeling's head rose noiselessly from the water, revealing pale gray skin that appeared to be covered in scales. She had large, luminous eyes and needle-like fish's teeth. Her hair, bleached of color, moved with the lapping ripples around her shoulders and fronds. 
We don't have much time. The creature is above the cave, hunting. All right, Cynthia said quickly. Let's go over the plan again one more time. I'll give you my necklace when we reach the surface, and you can change first. Then you give the necklace back to me, and I'll become you. Well, I'll look just like you, I guess. We go back to the castle with enough of the monster's go to ensure you don't have to get married to Jeffrey. Cynthia nodded, her face determined. Did you decide who you wanted to change into once you give me your name? The changeling's eyes didn't blink. I did, Cynthia said slowly. Well, I don't want to be a someone. I want to be an, an animal, a horse. The changeling stared at the princess. A horse, she repeated. I know it's stupid, but I always thought horses are the most beautiful creations and the most free when they're running. It was either a horse or a house cat, and I didn't like the idea of catching and killing mass and birds. Cynthia's brow furrowed. I like it, the changeling told her. Unexpected. But all I know is that the necklace changes you to whatever you want. I just don't want to be ridden by anybody, though, once you get me back there. The changeling thought about it. Once you're a horse, we probably won't be able to communicate like this anymore, but if I'm the princess, then I can tell them that you're not to be saddled or ridden ever. Promise? Cynthia asked her. You'll be able to run as far and as fast and as free as you like for the rest of your days, the changeling promised. I swear it. They won't be able to tell the difference between us? I mean, old me and what you'll look like to them? Well, we have different personalities, the changeling admitted. But as far as appearances, we'll look exactly the same. I'll look just like you. I wish I still had the necklace my mother gave me. I must have lost it when the monster got me. They would have for sure convinced them you're me, Cynthia mused. It's all right. I'll have this one on still. And I can always have another pendant made for it. Ruby, was it? Cynthia nodded. We should get going before that thing gets back, the changeling told the princess. Her third eyelids slid over her eyes like an amphibian's as she aced the princess in a serious voice. You aren't afraid? A little, the princess said, her own eyes wide. You'll only have to hold your breath about a minute, and then when we get topside, you can finish telling me everything I need to know about your family. All right, Cynthia said, standing. I'm ready. That's my time. I sure appreciated getting to know y'all a bit better through a story. What a wonderful audience you've all been. I hope you can come back by and see me sometime. Like I said, my name is Persia Beatty. That's B-E-A-T-T-Y, honey. I'm the steward of Wildwood Province in the land of Dor, where I'm also the national storyteller. My husband's name is Huck Honeycutt. My son's name is Esau Hoofbeat. And we are all very much looking forward to further meeting y'all up there in clay people country. But until that time, remember what old Persia tells you now. Whatever you do, however you be, wherever you go, keep going.